Good morning and welcome to Genesis. We are grateful that you decided to make gathering with us a part of your weekend. Service will begin in just a couple of minutes. If you are a Facebook user, we encourage you to open your Facebook app and check in and visit our Genesis Church page to share a link to today's experience. This is a great way to share the ministry of Genesis with those in your circle of influence. Genesis Church uses the Church Center app as our information hub. In the app, you can update your information, check your kids in, register for events, interact with your connect group, and even contribute financially to the ministry of Genesis. You can search Church Center in your device's app store. Today's service will begin with a time of singing, followed by corporate reading of scripture and prayer. Then one of our pastors will teach a practical message from God's word. Every service concludes with a time of communion, a practice where followers of Jesus celebrate his death and resurrection as the source of our salvation and spiritual life. If you are new to Genesis, we encourage you to participate at the level of your comfort in any and all aspects of the service. Again, thanks for being here today. It is our hope that you feel at home and experience God's love in a meaningful way.
nothing else in this world can satisfy. You're the only one. You're the only one. Just sing that chorus again. There's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing. presence is felt so strong and so sweetly across this whole place, that if there's any doubt in anybody's mind, that you're not as good as we proclaim that you are, God, that they can tangibly just feel your presence right now, God, that you would be so real in this place that there's, there's no denying who you are all of your greatness. There's no one that can give life and to give hope and to give peace like you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing in this world that even compares, that can even come close. God, thank you.
mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and the dance. Praise him with the strings and the pipe. Praise him with the sounding cymbals, with the loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Father, we lift your name high this morning. God, in the midst of all of our various circumstances, our challenges, our trials, the pressures and the demands of life, Father, we lift our eyes, we orient our hearts this morning to your goodness and your grace that you have demonstrated to us in Christ Jesus. And with the breath that you have given us, we return our praise to you and thanksgiving and in celebration of all that you are and all that you have done for us in Jesus name amen let's worship together this morning through the re reading of scripture together I'm going to get us started today join in with us today blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ, as a plan for the right time 
to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. You know that last verse, that he did it at the right time. I don't know about you, but sometimes I question God's timing, I question God's ways. God, why did this happen? Why didn't you do this sooner? When you, when you look around at the suffering and the pain in the world, sometimes we question, God, what, what's the delay? What's the reason behind this? We, we know the promise is that you're going to one day bring a healing to the nations. You're going to restore this broken world for good. What's the delay? We, we echo the sentiment of John the Revelator in Revelation 21. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. John sees the new heavens and the new earth. John sees the healing of the nations. John sees the day where there will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more death no more sorrow, that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, any praise. Lord, hasten the day, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. When we look around at the circumstances in the world, we feel pain and pressure in our own personal lives, and sometimes we question, God, why, where are you? But we find solace in the promise of that, that God chose us that he predestined us to become sons and daughters, that in his love he has pursued us, in his love he is pursuing us, that he is the one that holds all things together. And if we trust in him, he will hold us, he will protect us, he will provide for us in the here and now, and we will one day experience the fullness of his kingdom when he does come and bring restoration to this broken world. So in the next few moments, can we just offer our praise personally and privately to God for his goodness and his grace that he has demonstrated to us. Father, we thank you today for the promise of your word. God, our finite minds sometimes struggle to, to find meaning and purpose. God, in the pain that we experience and the suffering that we endure and that we see so prevalent around us, but today in the midst of it all, we choose to trust in you. We choose to trust in your wisdom, God, that you are indeed working all things together for our good, God, according to your good pleasure, according to your will. And Father, we pray for the strength, God, to endure. We pray for the faith. God, to continue to walk day by day with our hope and our trust in you. God, in the midst of it all, God, to pursue a life of good works. God, to carry your presence and your hope, God, to those around us that are feeling the pain and the pressure of this life as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we celebrate the goodness of God one more time? Amen. Well, welcome again to Genesis today. You may be seated for a little while, man, we're so glad that you took time to gather with us today. We want to remind you on your way out today, the offering baskets will be in the back of the auditorium. Uh, there's a connect card in the seat back in front of you that we encourage you to fill out and turn in at the end of the service. You can do that uh, through the app, through the Church Center app as well. Uh, today, we're going to wrap up our series on the gospel by talking about the gospel sends us out. And the reality today is Jesus commanded us to go to the ends of the earth to make disciples of all nations. And the reality for many of us is that we will never be able to personally do that. We may never go overseas, may never go to a foreign country to preach the gospel or to share Jesus with others. But every week through our faithfulness in giving, we're able to live faithfully to Jesus' commands. Every week through your faithful giving, uh, because of your uh, faithfulness and contributions, we're able to support great organizations uh, like the ARC, the Association of Related Churches, whose mission is to plant life-giving churches both, uh, both nationally here in the States and around the world. We're able to support great organizations like World Vision, 
who is committing to serving the world, the marginalized and the poorest of the poor in some of the hardest to reach places of the earth. And while we may never physically be able to go every week through your faithfulness in giving, your money goes where you will never be able to go touching people, ministering to people in the name of Jesus. So Again, today, we thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, there's multiple ways to give. You can give through the Church Center app. You can give online at mygenesis.tv backslash give, or you can give physically in the service today. There's an offering envelope in the seat back in front of you that you can drop in the offering envelope on your way out today. Well, today, we bring our journey that we have been in over the last several weeks talking about the gospel wrestling with some of the big questions of the faith of what is this good news that we talk about. Paul says in Romans 1 and 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power that saves us. And if it is the power that saves us, it behooves us to ask those questions, what is the gospel? So let's go back to our text this morning in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, it says, After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming this good news of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. So over the last three weeks, we've been talking about the implications of the gospel, this good news that saves. And it's not just a a big theological theory. It's not just doctrine, but it is the power of God that saves us. It is what calls us into relationship with God. It is what reorients our life. I love that verse 18. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Upon the announcement of the good news of God, that the kingdom of God was breaking into this world, they left everything to follow Jesus. They completely reoriented their lives around him. So the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about these three principles that Number one, the gospel calls us in, that it is through the gospel that we are brought into not only communion with God, but into the new family of God. Paul talks about in Corinthians that we are baptized into the body of Christ, the church, that through the gospel we have found a new identity with new belonging, that God has created a new family to bear witness to his glory and grace in the world. Last week we talked about the reality that the gospel remakes us. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. Right now, your life is oriented around this. But as you begin to follow me, I'm going to make you into something else. I'm going to transform your life. I'm going to give you a new identity. I'm going to give you a new purpose. And as we follow Jesus, we experience transformation. Listen, not just by going to church, not by just being around spiritual or religious things, but by actually committing ourselves to the words and the ways of Jesus, we experience the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about this principle principle that in the gospel Jesus preached, it wasn't about getting you into heaven, but about getting heaven into you. But today, we want to add one more phrase onto the end of that. In the gospel that Jesus preached, it wasn't about getting you into heaven, but about getting heaven into you and heaven into the world through you. And today we want to end our series by talking about the truth that the gospel sends us out. That the gospel call is not just one to personal piety. It is not one to just a private faith. But God in his goodness and grace wants to grow his family, wants to extend the influence and the reach of the kingdom of God, wants every person in every culture in every place to experience the life-giving power of this good news. And he does so by the means of his people, the church, by the means of his people, Christians like 
you and I, every gospel ends with Jesus commissioning his people to go into all the world and share the good news of his life, death, and resurrection. In Matthew's gospel, it reads this way. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's so easy to read that and think about, oh, this is a command for missionaries, for people that are going to Africa, that are going to China. I don't know about any of you, but for those of us that grew up in church, you know, we, you know, we, we preachers talked about being faithful to God and answering the call of God. And most of us had a moment like this of, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. Just don't send me to China. God, I, I, God, I want to be faithful to you. I want you to use me to make a difference in the world. Just let it be right here. I don't want to go, you know, we hear tales of missionaries that braved the jungles and went to exotic locations. And we're like, God, that's so awesome for them. But I don't know that it would be that awesome for me. I like air conditioning. I like indoor plumbing, you know? So it's like we hear that and we're like, oh, that's for the other people. But that phrase, therefore go, doesn't mean like go buy a ticket, book a trip and go over there. The literal rending, rendering of that is as you go. That it's, it's a command that in the course of our everyday lives, we are to be mission-oriented around the kingdom of God, that in the course of our everyday life, we are to live as a disciple of Jesus, committed to the words and the ways of Jesus with the intention, with the mission of sharing the good news of Jesus with other people. And again, we hear that and we're, we, we hearken back to the days of like door-to-door evangelism. We're like, do you know Jesus if you died tonight? You know, would you go to heaven kind of stuff? And it's not even talking about that. It's about living faithfully to Jesus in such a way that we bear witness to the transforming power of the kingdom in our everyday lives. The Great Commission is a command to live on commission with Jesus. That being faithful as a disciple means that I live with the intent of bringing the goodness of God's kingdom into my sphere of influence. And as we're going to flesh out today, not by force and not by coercion and not through condemnation, but simply by living faithfully faithfully to the words and the ways of Jesus. It is an invitation to live for something bigger than myself. The reality for many professing believers is that they prayed a prayer and and in the, in the that salvation was this transactional moment where they in their minds punched a ticket to heaven and everything beyond that is, is kind of like optional ex- extra credit. But in the gospel that saves, the call to discipleship, to surrendering our lives to the words and the ways of Jesus is not optional extra credit. It is the very means of God's salvation. In John chapter 17 which is one of the most beautiful chapters in all the Bible. We're familiar with the scene on the night Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane where he is praying this prayer of intercession to the point that other gospel writers include the note that he was literally sweating drops of blood, that he could feel the intensity and the pressure of the moment, knowing what was about to occur, was, was, was impending. Well, this is the prayer. John includes the prayer that Jesus was praying, and he prays to the Father concerning his disciples. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Understanding that a call to the words and the ways of Jesus are going to distinguish us 
from the culture and the attitudes of the world around us. He says, sanctify them. We talked about that last, one, last week, that to be sanctified is to be made holy. It's to be set apart for a mission, a purpose. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth as you have sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world. Which brings us to our overriding point today, that the church is in the world for the sake of the world. The church is in the world for the sake of the world. We're familiar with John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. We can re-render that today, that for God so loved the world that he sent his son for the life of the world. And Jesus says, as you have sent me, I am sending them. For God so loved the world that he sent his church into the world for the life of the world so that people may know the truth concerning the life, death, and resurrection, the forgiveness of sins, inclusion into the family of God, that they might experience life-giving, life-transforming relationship with God as Jesus was sent into the world because of the love of God. The church has been sent into the world because of the love of God. Leslie Nugabin, who was one of the great writers and theological thinkers of the mid-last century, wrote in one of his books, uh, I believe it was Foolishness to the Greeks, talking about the power of the gospel. He says, it is a terrible misunderstanding of the gospel to think that it offers us salvation while relieving us of the responsibility of the life of the world. For the sin and sorrow and pain which our human life and that of our fellow men and women are so deeply interwoven. He says the gospel doesn't just save us into this life of private faith where we wait for heaven. But the gospel redeems us in that it sends us back into the world. That in the same way Jesus said, I have come to proclaim liberty to the captives. I have come to bind up the brokenhearted. That the mission of Jesus is in inherently the mission of his church. So for the remainder of our time today, we want to wrestle with the question, what does it mean to be sent? What is the mission of the church in the world? If the church is in the world for the sake of the world, what does that look like? And that's been the subject of debate for the last 2,000 years, and it is a hot topic of debate in our current political and social climate here in America. There are those that have stood on the principle for years that the church is neutral when it comes to political, social, uh, cultural issues, that we're not aligned with a party, with an ideology, but we stand removed from it and we, we simply speak truth to power. That we declare the truth of God's word no matter whose truth that stands against from an ideological standpoint. But we've seen a shift in the last several years, really beginning about four decades ago with the rise of the moral majority and the religious right where the church, the evangelical church has leaned more rightly, has leaned more Republican, and has aligned itself ideologically with a political party. And today, we're not going to dive into the weeds. We're not going to open a Pandora's box of mess. But today, as we consider what does it mean to be the church, what does it mean to be in the world for the sake of the world, we've got to understand that through a cultural lens. We've got to understand that through a societal lens, through a political lens. And we've seen this this shift of evangelical Christians increasingly picking up arms to wage a cultural war. Uh, A couple weeks ago, there was a big dust up. Tim Keller, um, who is a great thinker, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York, planted that church in the mid-80s, has long been this uh, centrist figure of we stand apart from political parties, we speak truth 
to power. And a couple of weeks ago, one of the leading conservative uh, theological uh, magazines, First Thing Magazine, wrote an article basically saying the time for that kind of approach is over. We've got to draw lines in the sands. We've got to fight. And there was a big dust up over that ideology. But what we've got to understand is that when we begin to war against culture, when we buy into the pressure of fear and angst, when we begin to think about culture in terms of winning and losing, we invariably begin to shift from the ways of Jesus in order to fight against the culture. Jesus has not called us to win. Jesus has not called us to conquer. Jesus has not called us to dominate. Jesus has called us to follow him, to embody his words and his ways. We cannot influence culture to a more Christ-like way by means that stand in opposition to the ways of Jesus. I love what Jared Stacy says. He says, culture wars make militant Christians who in the end have to reject the way of Jesus in order to win in the name of Jesus. And that's why you have politicians that are weaponizing Christianity for the sake of appealing to a conservative base that very much wants culture to be, to be tolerant of, to be favorable of Christianity. There was one Republican uh, candidate in Georgia this week that I heard say that her political mission statement that we believe in Jesus, guns, and babies was given to her by the Holy Spirit. To which I respond, blasphemy. It's a wouldn't expect a whole lot of amens there. <laughs> but what does it mean to be in the world for the sake of the world? In a political, cultural, hot button, powder keg moment that we find ourselves in. A, a few weeks ago in late April, um, the Cleveland Guardians, formerly known as the Cleveland Indians, professional baseball team, was playing at the New York Yankees, and it was a tie game, the bottom of the ninth. The Yankees were at, at bat, and the fans in the outfield were doing what home team fans have a tendency to do, heckling the, the Cleveland Guardians outfielders, when finally one of the Cleveland Guardians outfielders had had enough and began to turn around and engage verbally with the fans to the point that it, it escalated to the point that he climbs the outfield wall with the appearance that he's about to go into the stands to escalate this thing to way across the line. And as I was reading about that and looking at, looking at that picture, I thought, you know, for years as conservative Christians, we were the home team. Our culture was not just tolerant of but favorable to Christian ideas now, it was a nominal Christianity that was largely Christian in name only, which harkens back to the Apostle Paul writing in 2 Timothy 3 and 5 of holding to a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. But for centuries, we've been the home team. But we're not the home team anymore. Our culture is becoming increasingly secular, increasingly liberal, increasingly intolerant of faithful Christian convictions. And that's where a lot of our pressure is being felt. That's where a lot of this fear, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. We've got to do something. We've got to fight back against this liberal drift. And I love what Ed Stetzer is one of the leading voices in evangelical uh, church environments today, he says the sky is not falling, but the ground is shifting. And I think that's so true. The sky is not falling. We're, we're not the home team anymore. And it's going to be increasingly hostile towards us. 
The question we've got to answer is, how are we going to respond? Are we going to climb into the stands and pick a fight with those that are heckling us, with those that are standing against us? Or are we going to stay faithful to the words and the ways of Jesus? I was rereading an article that was actually published in 2004 um, by Robert Louis Wilkin as he chronicles the rise and subsequent fall of Christian culture in Europe. And at the conclusion of his article, he wrote this, which was incredibly profound in 2004 when it was published, but even possibly more relevant to us today. He says, if Christian culture is to be renewed, habits are more vital than revivals, rituals more edifying than spiritual highs, the creed more penetrating than theological insight, and the celebration of saints' days more uplifting than the observance of Mother's Day. There is great wisdom in the malign phrased Latin ex operare operetto, which translated, the effect is in the doing. He says, intention is like a reed blowing in the wind. It is the doing that counts. And listen to this phrase, if we do something for God, in the doing, God does something for us. And essentially he is writing that our culture's greatest need right now is Christians who live as Christians. Thank you. Our greatest need right now is not culture warring, is not ideological hills that we're willing to die on. It is simply faithfulness to the words and the ways of Jesus. It is Christians who live as Christians. It is Christians who answer the call of as you go, make disciples. Because the only way to make disciples is to live faithfully as a disciple. The church's presence in the world should reflect Jesus' presence in the world. Father, as you have sent me, I am sending them. And there are many in the evangelical world today that are fighting against enemies, that are drawing lines in the sand that are picking up arms to fight battles that God has simply not called us to fight. And they are doing so in ways that do not reflect the character of Jesus. The paradox of our faith is that victory was won in defeat. That our Savior did not conquer the powers of this world through the means of this world. But he conquered it through self-sacrificial love by laying down his life. And the only way we will truly win influence in our culture is by embodying the character of Jesus. And that is serving our world, those who like us and those who don't, those who are like us and those who are not through self-sacrificing love. Though, that though we stand in the arena and all of the people in the crowds heckle us and throw stuff at us, we do not retaliate through the means of this world. We simply stay faithful to the task that we are given by living faithfully to the words and the ways of Jesus. This week I've just been kind of reflecting on this thought and asking some questions of what does it mean to be the church? If the church is in the world for the sake of the world, and some questions that we could ask ourselves, of does our church reflect the character of Jesus? Does our church love the community like Jesus loves our community? Does our church produce produce disciples who are committed to the words and the ways of Jesus? And then on a more personal level, does my life reflect the character of Jesus? Do I love those in my circle of influence like Jesus loved people? Understandably today, we're not Jesus. 
So we're not going to do that perfectly. But is that our fundamental conviction? That I'm to love like Jesus loved? Am I committed personally to the words and the ways of Jesus? Today I want to conclude by going back to a passage of Scripture that we actually read together as a church last week in 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter is writing to Christians in Rome. A culture that is hostile to the Christian faith, a culture that is very non-Christian, very pagan, very heathenistic. And as we begin to consider what does it look like to live faithfully as Christians in a culture that is not Christian in character, side note, it never has been, I prayed today, God help me stay out of the weeds and It is amazing how some conservatives, some conservative Christians, treat the Constitution as almost a divine document when it classifies African American people as subhuman. So we are certainly influenced by a Judeo Christian ethic, but we are not Christian. We never have been Christian. Oh my gosh, I should have showed this video. I'm gonna, I'm going off the rails. I'm sorry. I prayed, and either I'm disobeying the Holy Spirit. There was a congressional candidate that literally stood on a stage talking about how great America was and applauded the fact that we took this country over from the Native Americans and slaughtered them so that we could become this great Christian nation. I was borderline between lamenting in tears and full-blown cussing, thinking you're going to appropriate the name of God to celebrate genocide of people that we did not consider to be human. We're not a Christian nation. We never have been. So as we consider what does it mean to be faithful in a culture that is post-Christian, we can look to Scripture, to early Christians who lived in a culture in times that were not favorable to our faith. And this is what Peter writes to them. He says, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness By these he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we we can know, we can have good doctrine, we can know the Bible and still be useless to God, unfruitful, unproductive in our faith as disciples. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted, I will confess, there are seasons of my life I've been blind, I've been short-sighted, I live from a place of a moral high horse that I'm righteous and I can't believe people out there would live that way and do those things and they just need God and they need the church, but that's not in and of itself fruitful or productive for the sake of the kingdom. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Culture wars want to call us to this moral high horse where we're concerned with how everybody else is living. Well, they need God. We need to fight against those who preach that or believe that or live that way. And yet the entirety of the New Testament is written to Christians, instructing them how to live Christianly. 
not giving them an arsenal of weapons with which to condemn or judge a culture who does not believe what they believe. Paul's writing, Peter's writing, even Jesus was not overly concerned with pagan cultures, but with Christians living Christianly. This is how you are to live because of the confession you have made. And if we want to be a faithful witness to Christ in our culture, we've got to quit condemning those out there. We've got to quit trying to impose our way of life, our beliefs on people who do not believe what we believe. Is there a time to speak hard truth? Yes. But in my experience, it is much easier to speak hard truths to people I have a relationship with rather than just shouting it out to the masses. And that's why we find, and I'm way off script, and if you're taking notes today, there's going to be a lot of empty places, but that's okay. That's why we find Jesus with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the outcast and the marginalized. For too long, the church has wanted to stand in its ivory tower and shout condemnation from the rooftops to the heathen masses. But that is not the way of Jesus. We live faithfully as the church with an as-you-go kind of faith. I don't don't know about you. Oh my gosh, I'm way off script and I'm going to go way over time and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank God there's not a second service. I grew up in in a church culture that was like, we can't associate with those people. But we sure had a lot to say about them. Godless heathens, they need Jesus. They do. And guess where Jesus was found? Among them. Not in a uh, uh, wishy-washy, everything's okay kind of love, or it's okay that you live that way. No, Jesus lived in proximity to them so he could show them a better way. So we could speak the truth of the gospel to them, not lobbing bombs of gospel truth out into the world, hoping that people will turn and see the ways of God. No, but living it as an embodied presence among them. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. What does it mean to live faithfully as the church? It means to live as you go kind of faith. That primarily I'm more concerned about am I living faithfully to Jesus than whether or not my neighbor is living faithfully to Jesus. Because as my life is transformed by the Holy Spirit, then I become a compelling witness to the gospel to those around me. I want to challenge you today. We're in an election cycle. Some of us, would, it would do well for our soul to turn off the evening news, to turn off talk radio. I, today I'm preaching. You don't have to listen, but I'm preaching. It would do well for our soul. It would do well for our state of mind to shut out some of the noise of the world. Oh, Jesus, help me. I'm not saying it's anybody in here. But I know a lot of the Christian people that are being discipled more by Tucker Carlson than they are Jesus. I'll go the other way, that are being discipled by Rachel Maddow more than they are Jesus. We cannot be a faithful witness to the world if we are not being discipled into the words and the ways of Jesus. And the culture at large is a tool of the enemy to make us live in fear Because fearful people do irrational things. If we want to be a peaceable presence, one, if we want to live with peace, we may need to shut out the noise of the world, but if we want to be a peaceable presence for the sake of Jesus in this world, we need to be people whose lives exude peace because we are confident that at the end of the day, a crucified and risen Savior sits enthroned over the nations of the world and his kingdom will prevail over the nations of this world. And if you were taking notes, I'm sorry. 
there are there are some empty blanks. I'll, I'll, I'll finish with the last one. Faithfulness to Jesus will result in fruitfulness for Jesus. If we want to make an impact in this world, let's live faithful. Band, come. I totally missed the cue that I was going to give you. Would you stand with me this morning? The gospel calls us in. Our primary response of repenting and believing the good news is the surrendering of our own lives to the lordship of Jesus. It's not praying a prayer, punching a ticket to heaven. Salvation is experienced in following Jesus. The life of God is found in communion with God. Communion requires proximity to Jesus. Come, follow me. The gospel remakes us as we live up close to Jesus. Our hearts are changed. Our eyes are open to see the world differently. We're transformed for people who are primarily selfish to become more selfless like Jesus. And then the gospel sends us out as a people who are being transformed by the presence and the power of God. We live lives that bear witness to the goodness and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to do something a little different this morning as we close. We read, we read this passage of scripture together in service last week and we're going to read it again today but we've reworded it a little bit to make it more first person and personal. So uh, I hope you can see that. So here we go. Once you get, can you guys just make that black? We're going to assume, or I'm going to assume that you can read it. Here we go this morning. We're going to do it. Tell you what, we're going to sing while they're doing that. Let's pray. Amen. Here we go. We know what we're doing. Let's read this together this morning. His divine power has given me everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called me by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given me very great and precious promises so that through them I may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, I will make every effort to supplement my faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love, for if I possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will make me fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will make every effort to add to my faith. But look at what the end of that is. The end of that is love. The goal of spiritual maturity is not knowledge. It's not knowing more about God, knowing more about the Bible. It's manifested in love. That's what will make me fruitful. That's what will allow me to live as a faithful witness to the glory and the grace of Christ in this world. Father, we love you today. God, we are on our best days in perfect messes. That even when we're fully committed to this, we don't always get it right. God, because loving the world begins with loving those who are in closest proximity to us. Husbands, wives, children, parents, siblings, co-workers, friends. And Father, I pray today, God, that you'll call us back to the simplicity of the gospel. Of lives that are simply surrendered to you. who simply recognize that life is experienced 
in communion with you. And I pray this morning that our response to repenting and believing the good news of the kingdom will will not start with those out there, but will start with our own heart, our own attitude, our own view of you, our own view of ourselves. That this morning that our response to repenting and believing the good news will be to once again bow our knees in humility before you and acknowledge you as Lord and King over our lives today. Caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry. I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at As we prepare our hearts to come to the table of the Lord together, can we read this prayer?